Hello and welcome to this special edition of the Dragon's Lair podcast. I'm Jamie and joining me as always is Gavin Thomas. How are we doing, Gav? I'm, uh, yeah, I'm very well, Jamie. Excited about the chat we're going to have tonight. Absolutely. I'm very excited as well. Um, just to start with, a quick thank you to those who have been in touch regarding the episodes we did recently with Reese Blumberg, Bradley Roberts, Hugh Gustafson and Kerry Jones. Really good chats with those guys. We had great feedback on them as well. So thank you to those people. And if you haven't done so already, please subscribe and leave us a nice review as it all helps to grow the pod. Right then, so this is a special Q&A episode by popular demand. We have been very lucky for a small unofficial supporters podcast. We've had some brilliant guests on our pod, haven't we, Gav? We've had some fantastic oh, guests. Um, but the special guest tonight is probably our most requested guest, I would say, by listeners. And it's taken a while to get him on, I won't lie. But I am delighted to say we finally got him. Welcome to the pod, Dragons head coach, Di Flanagan. How are we doing, Di? Yeah, I'm very good. Thank you. Thank you for the invite. Um, uh yeah, thank you very much. Great to be on you. No, absolutely. Thank you for joining us. It's uh, it's great that you spend time with us uh, answering the listeners' questions. We are quite a few to get through, to be fair. So um, before we get into all that, there's only one place to start, really. Um, the big news that came out of the club this week was the retirement of Dragons' most cap prop, Lloyd Fairbrother. 172 appearances for the Dragons over 10 years. Um Lloyd's retirement is going to leave a big hole at the club, isn't it, Di? Um, what's your reaction to that news? Yeah, firstly, we're just losing a super person, aren't we? Um, yeah. Lloyd, partner Sophie, the proper clubman, um, always probably last to leave the Bisley. We'll spend hours at the ground speaking to fans. And and it's important, like I said to Lloyd, it's his club. He's not gone. His consistency and his routine is important. He's still, he's still around the club every weekend and things. And we love having him here. My family love his family being here and he's always welcome. And I'm sure we'll we'll, we'll make a good ambassador to Lloyd Faber for what he's done for this this region. Yeah, blue, blue, lovely words there, Di. And uh, we are hoping to get Lloyd on the pod very soon. But uh, yeah, it came as a shock to a lot of people, you know, his retirement. And um, I'm gutted about it. Gav, your quick thoughts on Lloyd's retirement? He's a, he's an old fashioned player that you don't get a type of anymore. He's he's someone who harks back to what rugby was like thirty years ago in a good way, no bad way. And uh, yeah, it's a massive shame. And when I saw it, really kind of saddened. But when I read, it, it made complete sense, you know, because ultimately you you you're here for a short time, aren't you? Yeah, I'm just pleased he got to represent Wales as well. Mm-hmm. You know, before. Um retiring so uh yeah all the best to Lloyd are we going to miss him at the club so my questions first and I pre-season how's it all going oh, it's been fantastic um the new blood in the staff the new blood in the squad and, and a lot of youngsters really stepping up so mm. I, there's a lot to touch on you know but people like Philo Tia Tia coming in adding his experience from the southern hemisphere and his memories of Welsh rugby being at the super successful region at the Ospreys just holding high standards Ryan Chambers only knows international rugby and a pretty good era under Warren Gatlin so having his his um his overview has been superb supported by Ryan Harris and um Will Bevan coming into the department as well some of the scores, some of the work that they put in has been unbelievable. I've, I've witnessed arguably my toughest Merth and Mouth session. I've been mm-hmm. in Welsh for 20 years and to watch a session like that put shivers down my spine and I didn't have to do it. So, yeah, yeah they've been good. And and some of our signings have brought, like, Lloyd, like, there's lots to name, but just people from, like, Lloyd Evans from the Guinness Premiership, Harry Wilson, yeah. Mon- um, Solomon Ufanaki coming from the Southern Hemisphere and Super Rugby. So it's, it's just given us more springs, strings to our bow now. Ah, oh, good stuff. Um, we had Bradley Roberts on the pod a couple of weeks ago, and he was very honest. He's a really nice guy. Something he said um, stood out to me, though. He said, the Dragons camp now feels like a high-performance environment that wants to create a winning culture. Now, Dad, you've been at the Dragons for three years now, so... Do you feel, for the first time since you've been here, that there's a change in the environment and culture of the Dragons compared to previous years? I would say our conversations have gone from being individually wanting to achieve for themselves and being a Dragons player to how can they be world-class? Um, what does it yeah. take to be world-class? To be world-class, you've got to surround yourself with world-class. You've got to put people in place who are driven. You've got to have aspirations that are above and beyond to go and chase, not just to play for the dragons that's that's 
that's the product. That's what people will see. But we got to have ambitions to create British Lions in this region. Other regions do it. We've done it previously, and and we 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 want to do that going forward. And we only want people in the building who who want to represent the Lions Wales, you know, because that will make them top end performance for our region. Yeah. Okay. So you've had a couple of sporting legends in the Dragons camp recently. I've seen. Um, you've had All Blacks legend Sam Sam Whitelock. He was there, and Welsh boxing legend Joe Calzaghe popped in. What's the thinking behind getting those guys in camp then, Dad? Is it to try and inspire that winning mentality, or what's the thinking yeah, behind it? It is. It's it's important that we spend time with people who've achieved. Uh, who's been the best in their field for long periods of time, and and we learn off them, and um. Sam Whitelock spending time with Ben Carter, Ryan Woodman alone will be golden for him. You know, yeah. some of the lessons they can learn off a, off a day with him and multiple different scenario, talking scenarios, talking experience, telling stories. That's the best way we learn as people is through storytelling. And and Sam was able to tell a lot of stories that he'd been through and share, share that, but also take in and challenge them boys on what they want to achieve. Um, and Joe Calzaghe, you know, he's a man of Gwent who's achieved... Mm. He unified the the titles and, you know, he's the best there arguably ever was. And he's from our region. So it shows it can be done. And, uh, and something I've learned is the people you surround yourself with the most is what you will be. Mm. So go out there, surround yourself with high-performing people because that will drive you on to be high-performing. And, and we've got good people in our building now and we're surrounding them with better people continually. And it's giving them aspirations and an understanding of what it takes. It's not easy. It takes no. commitment. It takes dedication. And seeing that first hand, you know, we can't. You can't pay for that. So, no. as Jamie said, oh, you've been there three years now, and you're saying there's a feel. But does it feel secure now? Is this new atmosphere, this new culture? Does it feel like something that's becoming ingrained and is there? Well, it's, it's, this is the start of my third year now. So I've come in. It's been. Um, it's been very educational for me this time in Welsh rugby and this time at the Dragons, you know, with what, what Welsh rugby has gone through. And I've loved it. It's my region. I care passionately about the place. I care passionately about the people as well. Um, the people who, like myself, grew up in our region and, and care for it. And and it's it's on me to, to change and give us aspirations and inspire our players, inspire our people to be the best they can be. And, and it's taken time. It surprised me how long it's taken, if I'm being totally honest. Um, when you're a young coach, you think you can change things like that. Things take time, and and it's it's been it's been hard hard work. It's been I could say educational. I've learned a lot, and and now it feels like it's starting to build momentum into what I would see it being. It's a big organization, and organizational change does take time, doesn't it? And and sometimes there is about the personnel, so. You you talked about uh, Philo coming in and and uh, Ryan Chambers. So the guys who kind of moved up from the academy, what what are they bring in to the uh, to the atmosphere and to the approach now? So uh, you've got Sam Hobbs now fully at the club. What what Sam bring in? Sam's very driven. Uh, he's a he's a rugby knows anyone who knows Sam knows he's he knows the insides and outs of everything in rugby he doesn't leave a stone unturned he he's played he was very close to the Welsh squad he was an understudy to Gethin Jenkins he might not like me saying that because he believe he's as good as him <laughs> a lot of us have been through the school of Gethin Jenkins and it's hard school but he educates you and he gives you an understanding of the game and, and Sam's been through that he's had good coaches along the way and people like Danny Wilson that you can learn off um, he's done it the right way I would see he's worked he's worked in a school you worked in academy and age grade, national age grade. You sacrifice a lot of time. You've got to put the graft in. You've got to learn your trade because coaching is like any other trade. You've got you've got to do your apprenticeship. Um, it's not you can't just walk up and coach. Them myths are, are wrong. It takes time, and you've got to learn to coach. You've got to learn to deal with people. You've got to understand the ups and downs that come with coaching. And Sam's been through that, and um, now is his time. He he's got a lot of respect with the pack. Um, he was great. He had a great relationship with Mevin Davis and Luke Naraway. And um, it's, it's over to him now. He, he's, a, he's very stern, doesn't, doesn't suffer fools. And he's very knowledgeable and he understands, again, what it takes to be top end. Great stuff. OK, um, are we ready for listeners' questions, Di? 
we all be ready for this. Need to be ready for it. So yeah, let's, <laughs> go. <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's go into it. Um, Adam gets in touch. First question, and he's touching on the season that's just gone. That it was a very disappointing and tough season, wasn't it, Day? And Adam gets in touch and asks, "What has been the biggest lesson learned from last season?" I think so. If we look holistically, it's how you manage the environment through the toughest times because we experienced some tough times and and we were a little bit away from certain results. And you can't be too up and too down. You've got to stick with process. I think we. And the reflection of me, we were too focused on outcome a lot, and it allowed us to change some behaviours, which isn't isn't high performance. We need to look at process, and we need to believe in what we're doing. And, and the learning is finding our way. Sometimes we chopped and changed, and and we weren't consistent in what we we believe we are and what what we should be as people of Gwent to represent our people. And and a big thing you'll see now is a Gwent identity to how we play, a tough edge. Mm. consistency in our behaviours and a style of play that hopefully our people can be proud of. And I think that's really interesting that I've brought up with guests before. I think people forget that Gwent, you know, we produce some great creative players, but if you think about the tight five and the back rowers we've created in the Eastern Valley, so you know, there is a tough old edge to Gwent rugby really, isn't it? I think, I firmly believe we have the best of all worlds in Gwent. I said this to the staff when we've got together before the season started and I grew up watching Newbridge, watching Ponypool, watching Ebervale. And anyone from the Valleys who watch them teams know it's graft, it's blue collar, it's tough. It's a big pack and they're not going to take a step backwards. But the luxury then, someone like Matt O'Brien grew up watching Newport who had sprinkles of stardust and talent and flair throughout Newport's history and and we've got a we've got an opportunity to blend the two and find our way. So we, we should be we play at Rodney Parade. We need to be entertaining. We need to be quick. But we also represent the valleys where we need an hard edge, just to an edge. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, this next question, I was the most popular question that we had. We had so many questions about this. Um, Stephen, Ellis, Jeremy, Graham, Greg, Keith, or just some other people that got in touch with me. And they're all asking the same question. Um, it is regarding props and the scrum. So according to the official URC website, the Dragon Scrum last season was ranked 16th, which means our scrum is the weakest in the league statistically. Um They've all asking the question if you were planning on bringing in another tight head prop because that's where they feel that we are most vulnerable. And then the Lloyd Fainer brother news broke, of course, didn't it? And then we had even more questions <laughs> asking about this. So, Di, I know it's late in the season and there's budget restrictions and everything, but is there any chance of bringing in a new tight head prop? We're actively looking for... We haven't finished our recruitment, is the fairest way to say, without targeting certain positions. We're all aware of where we needed to improve from last year, hence some changes in the coaching around that area and stuff. But, you know, we can only deal with the personnel we had and the young. But there's an expectation now on the players as well. Mm. The players need to front up. They're not young no more. Um, we're pushing them on. We're seeing great growth in them. We haven't finished. We're constantly active looking. We've got to manage the WIU on non-Welsh because yeah. if we were to bring a prop in, he would need to be that. We obviously have budget restraints, so we need to go down that route. But sometimes your biggest budget might be winning and it may have to be that. But we have high expectations for the current front rowers. But we believe we've got two, two front rows that compete, compete at this level, if not better, full of international players. But we are actively looking, we're using contacts, we aren't finished. Mm. And it's going to be a very big season for Leon Brown as well, isn't it, Di? You know, hopefully he can have an injury-free season, but this is the time now we really need him to uh, to sort of step up and have a, a bit of luck with injuries and have a run of games because it just hasn't happened for him, Sally. And it's a shame because we all know we're big fans of Leon on this pod, but we're just desperate for him to have a string of games with the Dragons and get back into the whale setup. Yeah, what, what I'd just say to give people confidence is we put Leon first, We've given him the time he needs to get strong, big mm. and strong. Um, every time Leon's fit, everyone wants to pick him, don't they? And sometimes yeah. just the gentleman <laughs> Leon and I haven't been involved too much, but I know he's a fantastic athlete and what I'm seeing and he's, he's an unbelievable scrummager at the moment. So we just need to make sure we we have a massive alignment with the WU on Leon, which is his music to my ears now. We're using the best resources we have in Welsh rugby. We're tapping into their physios. We're tapping into their coaches. We're also using our physios and our coaches and this constant dialogue to make sure everyone puts Leon Brown first and 
and we have high hopes that the person you see and meet can hit some high ceilings for us. Yeah, I met Leon on Monday at the family event and um, he looked in really good shape and he said to me he's fit and injury-free, he's raving to go, which is great news. So, um, yeah, fingers crossed uh, Leon can have an injury-free and, season. And that's it. The one thing he is now is extremely strong. And when yeah. you get core strength, you can become durable. So we've given him that time because we've put Leon first. Hmm. Good stuff. Okay, Matthew gets in touch. He asks, what would be considered a successful season for the Dragons? And then he also adds... Would also be nice if we targeted certain away games as we have to win away from Ronnie Parade more often this season if we want to succeed. Yeah, I think that's a fair point, Di. I don't know what you think about that, but what, what we're considered a successful season then for the Dragons, what's your targets then, if you like? I think, like I said previously, our home form, Rodney Parade Fortress, I think mm. a big holistic target for us is to really have an identity. So you, when you turn up to watch us play, you're proud. Yeah. Right, so with it and that, that's wherever you go. So if you come to Leinster to watch us play at the Aviva Stadium, you go, that's the team that represent me. That's the team I'm proud to watch. And then, you know, wins will follow and we want to win. We want to compete. We want to be on top table. Like we won't hide behind the fact that eventually we want to be a top eight team. Now that, that can be a slow process or that can be a fast process depending on how we as staff and players do our jobs. But we need to be better. We need to represent our people better and we need to pick up more wins. Yeah, good stuff. Okay, um, Progressive Rugby gets in touch. I don't know if you're familiar with them, Di. They're a player yeah, of yeah, their yeah, lobby group. Quite a bit of their social media stuff. Yeah. Oh, good stuff. Um, they've been in touch. Two questions. They're cheating a little bit, but I'll let them off because they are quite um, two important questions, to be fair. So the first question they're asking you is, will you continue your minimum two-week stand-down for players with diagnosed concussion? Hey, the, the, I will always put players first. So that's yeah. the simple answer. If I believe that's right, I'll do that. Um, you know, these last two years have been really, really ed interesting, educational and, and really tough. So sometimes in life, you've got to go back to what you believe in, your values. And, and like my first value will always be family and they'll be there whatever happens. My second yeah. value will be connections, which is people. Oh, I value people. I value the relationships. And then my third value is always making the right choice. And sometimes you've, through tough periods, you're really tested on your beliefs and I will always do the right thing. And so without directly answering the question, I think I've answered it as player yeah. comes first. Excellent. Okay. And the second question is, does Dai have concerns the reduced squad could lead to an over-reliance on key players and when injury bites, the need to elevate players earlier than desired? Is that a concern of yours, Dai, about the squad sizes and having to rely um, on too many players? key players or oh, not not massively i think we make a big thing about these squad sizes but we've got 40 senior players mm, okay contracted. we've got 12 senior academy players contracted who are over 19 to 23 so we could all play regional rugby comfortably so that's 52 players we can pick from i think it's about how we manage them in the week it's about managing their load collision. We, we're now introducing the gum shields in our league, which is superb because we'll wear them throughout the week and match days now. So we can get a real yeah. understanding of actually how many collisions they can take. Is that uh, the haptic gum shields that kind of identify the risk level of, of the contacts? That's it, yeah. yeah. Um, but, but it gives us an understanding then. Um, I'm not overly concerned because I think we do the right thing here at Gwent and we would never put a kid into a senior game if he's not prepared. Uh, I would more likely play someone out of position who's capable of playing at our level. Okay, excellent stuff. Um, next question relates to our attack. Um, the attack was a bit of an issue for the Dragons last season. So again, according to the official URC website, Dragons were ranked last for tries scored, line breaks, offloads, metres gained and defenders beaten. And Garth is asking, what should we expect our attack to look like this season? Fast. I think yeah. our biggest learning, and I've been very public with this, was we didn't go forward. Number one rule of rugby is you've got to go forward. And we didn't go forward. So if you look at our recruitment, if you look at how we structured the season, you look at the size and physicality of our youngsters coming through, we'll be a lot more collision-based, but we will play very quick as well to allow us to play to our DNA. Excellent. Okay. Um, Rich gets in touch and asks, is everyone fit for the new season? Now, we know Alan Wainwright obviously won't be. He'll miss the first block, won't he? But um, can you give us an update on the overall squad fitness? I've yeah, seen a few conspiracy theories as well about Ollie 
Um, is Ollie available? Not currently, no. Okay. Currently um, working through some stuff with Ollie, obviously, to make mm. sure he becomes durable like we want Leon Brown to be. So not currently, but um, we, we've picked up the odd niggle. Like we may not see a few players in pre-season, unfortunately, but we expected them all ready for the start of the season. So if you don't see players in pre-season and it hasn't been announced, don't worry. They'll be ready for the Ospreys. Okay. Um, but yeah, <laughs> it's, 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 the, it's the nature. If we actually want to improve and we want to get better, we need to push players harder physically and we need to do more. And, and along that way, the odd tweak or little, little break happens, but it's nothing of major concern to me. It just means that like, we may be two players you might not see in pre-season will be ready for the Ospreys game. Good stuff. Okay. The Pirate Rugby Podcast gets in touch and they ask, how are the Dragons hoping to reduce the number of injuries this season, particularly in the back row? So something I noticed last season, I, every game week, I look on the Dragons website at the injury list. We always seem to have at least 14, 15 players out injured every match week. Um, I mean, what is that down to? It, it can't be just bad luck, can it? Or what can I we do to reduce them? If I just touch on the back row specifically, I think it's the game. I think you arguably yeah. squad wise need to carry carry more back five players, second rows and back rows than any other position because they make the most contacts, they're in the most contact areas, they have the most tackles, they have the most carries. So if, if I'm playing and I have two carries, which and then maybe a half a tackle in the game, which in my career I wouldn't mm-hmm. risk to. Um mm-hmm. for my sevens making 20 tackles and 16 carries, his risk is higher. And that that's the game. So I think a reflection, that's why Shane's here, that's why uh, Funaki's here, that's why Steve's here. It gives us a lot more depth in them areas for when, unfortunately, injuries do happen. So can I, think... I ask about those particular players as well, Di? So one of the things me and Jamie talked about a lot last season was about the size of the ball carriers. Is, is that a conscious thing? Because you know, Steve Cummins is a big bloke, Funaki is a, a big bloke, you know, and uh, and Shane is a big bloke as well, aren't they? That they're all big, strong, you know, hard running guys. Was there a deliberate thing to try and uh, focus on getting those guys who can break the game line a bit? Yeah, I think hundred percent. We had a clear strategy. Um, myself and the guys around me, like James Chaplin and Co, helped me when we came to recruitment. We had a clear strategy. We wanted to make sure we retain our best assets. So that was done early with Rio and Aaron. We didn't want to lose Rio, Aaron, and Tain. It took a bit longer, but we were, we were clear. We wanted to make sure that we retain our assets because they're the people that our our people come love to watch. Secondly, then, we wanted to protect our future. So I think that was some of our best business through the summer. Like the amount of interest that would have been there for Ryan Woodman, Joe Westwood, Harry Ackerman, to name a few, yeah. would have been through the roof. So we needed to make time and give them effort and make sure we protect our future. So was, they were the first two strands. We wanted to make sure we kept our assets and we protected our future. And then thirdly, obviously, we needed to add something to our squad. And we don't have the biggest of budgets, and I won't like budgets sometimes is just an excuse. We don't have the biggest of budgets. So we needed a, a philosophy of what we wanted to recruit. And we needed size. We needed some size in our squad. So yeah. our youngsters have added, and then our recruits have added in that area. Good stuff. Okay. Alan gets in touch. Uh, you touched on it earlier, Di, but he's asking about Philo Tia Tia. How have the squad taken to Philo Tia Tia? Are they all getting on well with him? Is he scary, Di, at all? Is he a scary guy like he was on the field, or is he uh, no compromising? Yeah. yeah, he's a lovely man. Um, Again, to work in my environment, our environment, Gwent, now we need to make sure we do the right thing. Mm. Uh, we treat our people well, but we also demand excellence and we we need to be high performance. High performance comes at a cost sometimes. It's the hours you miss, it's the time you give. But just to echo on Philo, oh, he's so nice, no one wants to cross him, do they? <laughs> you certainly wouldn't want to cross him. <laughs> but yeah, um, I think just from a cultural point of view, he's... He's well travelled. He understands people superbly well, and his values are second to none. And he lives them, and all he expects is everyone else lives them. Lovely stuff. Okay, Nathan asks: Is Astromanek still being used as the main training base this year? Because I think supporters have seen you've been doing some training in Cardiff down at the university. Um, are you going to use that facility yeah. more often, Di? Yeah. So we're back at we're back home now Monday morning. So what USW has been superb yeah. to integrate the new guys really, really change and, and 
adapt to some ways of playing, ways of thinking, ways of teaching. And we've the facility has just allowed us that. It's got multiple rooms. It's got an indoor facility because even though in the summer it's 50-50 if it's going to rain or not every morning, isn't it? So yeah, and it's got a massive gym and it, and it's got equipment like to help the rehab programs down here. So it's been a big asset for us for the for the last few months. But we we're home on Monday now. We're ready to go to war. Excellent. Darren gets in touch. He says, "What career path would you have chosen if it wasn't rugby?" Uh, that's a good question. I think mm. um, uh, 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 stories sometimes, and the world's a circle for the reason it comes round in a circle. When I finished playing at the Ospreys, I got told early by Scott Johnson, which was the best thing ever happened to me. I my contract was going up to a value I knew exceeded what I was worth, so I had choices to make then. And and if I'm being very very honest, I didn't think coaching was for me. Because I, I idolized the game, I studied it, I loved it. It would become all obsessant and and it's all I wanted. But I wanted something different. So I went into school teaching. But I remember sitting with Philo Tia Tia in Clan Darcy upstairs saying, I don't think coaching's for me. And this was when he was a coach at the Ospreys. Mm-hmm. And he just said something that stuck with me forever. Sometimes your path finds you, you don't find it. That's so good I advice. Yeah. Teaching, an opportunity come up and a couple of phone calls were made at the Scarlet from the Scarlet to see if I'd be interested in taking a kicking coach role because I had relationships with people down there and that started the journey. But I would always love to go back and teach. I have a passion for teaching and education and how 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 you teach styles of teaching. Like we shouldn't be sat in rows anymore. And I, my wife works in a school and I have discussions with school teachers quite often about being a bit more innovative. I love the way you can college adapts and things like that. But I also have a passion for property and I do like, like my dad's a builder, one brother's a, uh, a plumber, one brother's a chippy, the other brother works on site with my dad, my wife's family are in grounds work. So I do love property as well. And maybe one day, just to appease myself, I would love to do some sort of little, little trade and show that I could be a bit blue collar with the family as well in that sense. Excellent. And if you want to chat about education, Gav's your man, isn't it, Gav? You know all about the education sector. I do indeed, yes. <laughs> I was a head teacher for 15 years. Nice. What school? Oh, I have a school in East Sussex. I uh, I live in England, sadly. Well, I, tra- I trained in Bryn Mawr a lifetime ago now. Okay, that's okay. The English are okay to me. My mother's <laughs> family was English. She was born in England, so they're okay to me. So we live in Newport. My wife's a teacher, Di. She travels to London every day to teach. How nuts every is that? Day. Yeah, she loves it, though. She loves the school. She just loves it. I enjoyed the, the hour a day. I used to have to go to Park Scarlet's from New Turiga. And I kind yeah. of really didn't miss it when I started working in Gwent, because I'm only 10 minutes away from training ground now. To mm. Suddenly, you miss that time where you can ring your parents, your brothers, your grandparents at the time and we connect with everyone you don't get that now you're straight from training to the house two kids running yeah. around and it goes like that i always found when i was teaching that the commute for me was time just to unpack everything that had happened i imagine it's the same with well it is the same with coaching isn't it the journey away from a game or from a training session is that time where you can unpack what's happened or not happened that, that was exactly it there was an hour to decompress in the car before i got home to the family Exactly. Well, this next question ties in quite well with this conversation. So Tom gets in touch and asks, what do you do to relax outside of rugby? How would you chill die after the stress? I love, the my rugby? NFL. I love my American football. Who's your team? I'm a giant, unfortunately. I went to the first Giants game in London against Dolphins yeah. in Wembley in 2007. They won the Super Bowl that year. So that was my team. Um, we have season tickets to the... NFL in London now, so we go every year. Obviously, a lot of games class, so we give them tickets away. But when we can, we go. So I love my NFL. It's great access you get behind the scenes. The two little dogs, which often take me for a walk sometimes, is great because they're really good listeners. Um, better than some people sometimes. But, <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's tough to relax as a head coach because your mind does work double time over time. Yeah. Take a lot of things to heart that sometimes you think you're in full control of and you can't control, but it comes with the comes with the territory, I guess. So, yeah. were you were you not surprised by the news that Louis Rees-Amit hadn't made the roster at uh, Kansas City as an NFL fan? Do you think it was too much of a step for him? Uh, I wasn't surprised um, initially because I can imagine how tough he was. I was really impressed with how he'd done though. 
and how he took to it and some of the positive vibes coming out of Kansas for him. And mm. um, interesting that his, his shirt was in the top five sales shirts in the UK. And um, and people who know Louis realised that was one of his dreams when he was a long time ago as a youngster was to play NFL. So the opportunity to do yeah. it, he could always come back to Union, couldn't he, in a year, two, three years' time. And for this opportunity, maybe once in a lifetime for him. So it wasn't I, I've been really telling fun. everyone he'll come to the Dragons, but, you know, like... Uh... Uh, that, 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 that's my view. <laughs> we can't have a salary cap for one player. <laughs> no, 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 it might be a bit much. He's been picked up, haven't you, by the Jags for their practice squad. Good luck to him, I say, because this has that's, been his dream, hasn't that's, it? If that's true. I haven't seen social media at all for a day or two, but if that's true, yeah. that's exceptional business by them because they're the UK's team now as well, aren't they? Mm. They play in London twice, and so that's very... Uh, it'll be a good move yeah. for both parties. I don't think it's been confirmed yet, but that is what all the uh, the suggestion is. That's the rumours. I should point. Yeah, yeah sorry, yeah. I should point out that's the uh, the rumours. Um, okay then, Di, because we're running out of time. What is your message to support as ahead in the new season? Uh, I just think the experience of Rodney Parade, our club with a new CEO. Like I can't speak highly enough of Reese, how he's he's helped me now in this year because a lot of the stuff I was. Going through previously, he's taken off me to allow me to focus on the grass, which is superb because that's what mm. I'm doing. Um, the way he's setting the club up to succeed, hopefully, uh, is something I want to be part of for a long time, and hopefully he does and you guys do. But I, I just want us to entertain. I think some some of my regret and my learning from last year is you you turn up and you know we're desperate to win so we're going to play this way because stats say and it didn't quite work and no one really walked away super excited super entertained so my message to uh, to you guys to my players is let's go out and entertain entertain everyone and then we can walk away smiles on our faces hopefully a spring in our step climbing up that ladder excellent um gav any more questions for you before we wrap up Oh, I, I think uh, Dowie's answered everything I wanted to ask and has been really open and transparent. So thank you for that, Dowie. No problem at all, guys. Thank you very much. Yeah, brilliant. Um, thank you for joining us, Dowie. Really is appreciated giving up your time to speak to us. And best of luck for the new season because um, I'm not going to lie, it's been pretty tough being a drag spawn over the last few years. And look, we don't expect silverware. We're not expecting, you know, top eight or challenging for the URC, but we just want to be competitive and get a few more wins under the belt. That's what I'd really like to see. And um, I wish you all the best. You know, we we are all rooting for you and the team. And um yeah, just good um, luck. I, I'm hoping that uh, we'll see some improvement now because uh, really the supporters that. deserve it, Dad. You know, they've been uh, through the mill. They really do deserve I, it. Hold on, and that's the thing. That personally, when I go home and sit in a dark room, you, you feel disappointed for you guys who spend your, your good money to come and watch us play because you want to be proud of something. And and if we can cheer you guys up, we're doing something right then going forward and we'll we'll put, we'll get your back in. Like you've backed us through thick and thin from day one I've arrived, but many years before I arrived. And and we now need to repay that. Absolutely. And we need to get our loser win over Cardiff tonight because oh, that, that, was just that voodoo that. or hoodoo, whatever you want to call it, against Cardiff, it's getting ridiculous now. It it's is true. really getting ridiculous, isn't I it? We've it. I've only been here for four of the games. And now, like that one game at Rodney Parade, how we lost that one. I don't I know. know. But it is, it's big grey cloud, which we need to shift. And um, Bloomberg's excited to play against Cardiff. And I'm he's sure he is. It, so, uh, <laughs> you know, we look forward to Boxing Day at home, but we could do it before that at their place, which would be nice. Yeah, brilliant. OK, like I said, Dave, thank you so much for giving up your time. Come and speak to us. It really is appreciated. Best of luck for the new season. Gavin, thank you as always for joining me. And thank you, the listener, for downloading this episode. We hope you enjoyed it. We'll be back very soon to preview the new season. But until then, take care and goodbye.